All right, you ready? All right. Ah, good evening, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever, what time zone you're in. And welcome to B-Sides Tampa. Uh, who here is, this is their first B-Side conference? Ah, well, welcome. Um, who here is their, they've been to the one last year? All right. Well, to our new friends, welcome. To our old friends, welcome back. My name is Derek. I'm the president of the Tampa Bay chapter of IC Square. I'm one of your hosts for this particular conference. Uh, this year, we, our committee worked hard to develop a nice, well-rounded conference with tons of great speakers that will entertain, educate, and uh, get your uh, glands going. So without further ado, first person I'd like to introduce is our new executive director of IC Square, Mr. David Shear, and he's going to introduce our first keynote uh, speaker. So good morning, everybody. I know we're getting a little bit late to start, so I'm going to do the abbreviated version. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm David Chu, the Executive Director for IC Squared. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce our first speaker, Kevin Johnson. He's the CEO of Secure Ideas, a security consulting firm uh, based out of uh, Jacksonville, Florida. He's also a SANS faculty member. He's written courses for SANS Institute, he teaches for Black Hat, OWASP, MISTI, and others, and speaks around the country. His focus is application security and pen testing. Uh, Kevin has, runs a number of open source projects, including Samurai WTF and Mobisec. Uh, you can find his company's website at secureideas.com. And he's going to—he's got some other uh, bio stuff on his slide, so I'll, I'll cut to the quick. You may be a little disappointed. I don't know if you, this was covered in the advertisement. He, he's an avid uh, Star Wars fan, and he's planning to use one of his custom-made outfits here this morning. But he pulled into the wrong parking area, and the Renaissance Festival commandeered his Chewbacca outfit. So uh, you're going to have to catch him, uh, catch him another time in that. So, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for Kevin Johnson. So, I mean, uh, here it is. So I apologize. I'm not allowing anybody to touch my laptop. So they have to swap out for his first presentation. I'm going to very quickly try to get back online with the presentation I'm supposed to be giving. I got you. I got it. Yeah. I know he's touching it. He's touching it. Here, before you plug that in, let me get. That's right. Okay. It's okay. We suck at this, right? Awesome. <laughs> I wasn't kidding. Here, I'll move it there. Searching, searching. Aren't we all searching? There, you go. there awesome. We actually have a talk. This is great. And I'm on. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for waiting. Um, I always hate doing that little swap out, but at the same point, well, we're paranoid nerds. Today I'm going to talk about the security researcher, security besmircher. And this is a topic that actually means a lot to me. I've made so much to me, I made up a word. Um, besmirch is a word, but I guess besmircher is not, right? But wouldn't that be the person who besmirched? Right? Uh, I like making up words every once in a while. For example, my favorite word that I'm trying to get into the dictionary is passage. It's what you do when you're not driving. 
right? I'm going to pass in to, whatever, right? Nope, doesn't work. So I was already introduced. There's not much to say about me, uh, except I do want to make one correction. I am no longer a faculty member at SANS. Uh, not anything bad. I just always feel bad when I get credit for something I'm not. Uh, I was for seven years. Uh, I taught 16 times a year, and I run a company and have a family, so I had to resign. Uh, it just became too much. Um, but I do teach a lot. As a matter of fact, we're going to be teaching a, a conference in a, Orlando in April, which I'm excited about. Uh, I am a member of the 501st. That is the Star Wars costuming group that I'm a member of. And yes, I have an Imperial Guard, a TIE pilot, an Imperial crew member. I'm building a Stormtrooper and a Chewbacca. Um, and once I finish either the Stormtrooper or the Chewbacca, I'm going to start a Boba Fett. Um, we raised money for charity. Last year we did uh, something like $20 million worldwide. Uh, the Florida, the Squad 7, which is what I'm part of, we did a million dollars just in Jacksonville last year, which is awesome, I think. Uh, I also have kids. They're up on the screen. I'm going to talk a lot about my children, uh, mainly because I'm really impressed. I convinced a wonderful woman that I was worth spending time with, right? Uh, and she puts up with me still. Uh, we've strengthened our marriage through travel. Uh, I'm home long enough she's tired of me, and then I go away long enough that she misses me. So it, it works out very nicely. And we have two daughters, Brenna and Sarah, who sadly were not able to make it here today uh, because they wanted to, uh, but we're taking them to Monster Jam tonight, so we got to see monster trucks, right? But I talk a lot about them because I believe very firmly that they are why I do what I do, right? My job as a nerd, as a security person, is to make the world better, right? I, I'm a bad guy. I suck, right? I, my entire purpose as a consultant is adversarial testing, right? We come in, we hack you, we tell you where we, you messed up, we give you recommendations, but we don't fix stuff, right? We have a, a viewpoint that's different than most people. And I think that a lot of the security field has started to adopt this viewpoint. You suck, I'm out of here, right? That's what we do. We try not to, we try to help, but it's like, I'll give you an example. I had a customer call me up a couple weeks ago, I'm doing a test, and the customer says to me, so how's the test going? And I said, oh, it's going great. And they're like, so we're secure? I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's going great for me, <laughs> right? Would you like the 4 million credit card numbers back? I, you know, they, we never get to sell those. You know, like a bonus, right? Like if I steal money from your company, can I keep it? Never. They never let me, you know. But they always ask me, can you hack us like the real bad guys do? Really? You want me to do that? <laughs> you sure? But, right, this adversarial perspective, this red team perspective, in my opinion, is one of the main reasons why we're going to have the talk today. Because I believe that we have hit a point where we don't feel the law or ethics or morals should apply to us. And I have a problem with this. There's actually a very prominent security researcher. I always love that term, right? Uh, I personally am a physical security researcher. Last night I broke into four hotel rooms. But don't worry, I was just researching. But we have security researchers, a prominent one, who posted a blog post outlining why we, I'm not sure exactly who we are, but we should not be affected by the chilling effects of the law. That was the statement, the chilling effects of the law. And the person went on to explain that it was really inconvenient for us trying to do security research, for us trying to figure out where flaws are and everything else, to have these, oh, these pesky laws that prevented us from doing what we wanted to do. Now, I know, I respect this person. I don't necessarily agree with them, but I respect them. And I know that what they were talking about was things like the DMCA. The CFAA, which is vague as anything, right? I know that's what they meant. <coughs> but I have a temper. How many people here have a temper? 
Right? Yeah, right? How many people here have thought to themselves, man, I could kill that guy? Right? Would that be a chilling effect of the law to prevent us from doing that? Because according to the statement, it is. And there are a number of people in the world that would not be if I was not stimmied by the chilling effect of the law. Because there have been times driving down the road, right? That one guy who keeps his blinker on for 12 miles. I'm going to turn at some point, right? I just want to warn you now, right? We have this wild west. And uh, let's be blunt, one of the reasons we have the wild west is because there's so many flaws to find, right? Heck, my wife, Denise, who is a wonderful, wonderful woman, she puts up with so much, but she is so not technical, right? The first words out of her mouth when she met me was, I hate computers. It was a challenge, right? She now lives in a house that has a 300-pound AS400 in it. I don't know why. (laughs) But, right? She, when we used to send our daughter to public school, we now homeschool, uh, but when we did, she went into the system to enter in the money for the cafeteria, right? So instead of carrying cash and having it stolen by bullies, uh, right? You know, the bullies still steal my lunch money every day, but they make great Subway sandwiches. But um, my daughter, she would go in, my wife would go in and put money on my daughter's account. And then my daughter could just go into the cafeteria and buy her lunch. This was awesome. My wife found a SQL injection flaw in that website, right? She wasn't testing. She typoed her username, right? And hit the wrong key and didn't notice it and submitted it and it had a single quote. Now I know that if I had done that, you'd all be like, bullshit. (laughs) You accidentally typed a single quote, right? But my wife really did. And I get called, right? I'm in the other end of the house and she's like, Kevin, come here, right? So I come in and she's like, what happened? And I look at him like, oh, that is awesome, right? (laughs) How did you do that? And she's like, I don't know, right? Now my wife has learned, she's not one of those computer people, you know those ones, right? Where they have a problem, so they click random places and then they tell you they did nothing, right? She's not that person, which is luckily, so I figured out what was happening. We reached out to the school system and said, hey, you have a problem and you have a problem on a system that has my daughter's social security number, so we have an issue, right? And their answer was, No, that's not that big a deal. We don't think you understand. Our database has permissions set so you can't do anything bad. (laughs) Jackass. But, sorry, did they warn you guys? This is like a PG-13 talk right? Um, Because it makes me angry, right? But we have tons and tons of stuff. We have tons and tons of issues. We have hacktivism. Who made up that stupid word? It's like the cloud. But we have hacktivism. We have, I mean, heck, I'll be blunt, right? I've told people that my business goal is to be protested by the Occupy movement. I'd like to make so much money. There's an Occupy elderberry court. Nowhere close. (laughs) But how cool would that be, right? Walk out, no, it wouldn't be cool at all. But we have all of these things going on and all of these attacks and all of these breaches and how many people have been talked to about, hey, you know that sophisticated attack that happened at Anthem? Or the sophisticated attack that happened at Target? Or the sophistic? do you know what sophisticated means? Phishing. It even has the PH in it. But (laughs) apt. Um, We have all of this stuff going on. And we have to think about, right, how do we protect ourselves? Where are the threats coming from? I mean, like, let's be, how many people here believe that their computer is being targeted? Right? I got one hand up, one hand up, a couple hands, right? Now, I'll tell you right now, all those people that raised their hands, you're paranoid. (laughs) Right? So am I, by the way. (laughs) Right? And we know why we're paranoid, because we monitor our traffic, and holy shit. But... Right? We only got a few hands. The rest of you are wrong. Notice I didn't say you were specifically targeted. As in, I'm going to hack you. Right? But you're connected to the internet. That's a scary damn place. There's some videos you never want to see. But... He does. 
and he mails it out periodically. It's crazy. Don't click links. But it's a scary place out there. There's attacks going on constantly, right? And one of the problems we have is people don't even understand what they're fighting against. I went out to, how do I say this vaguely enough? That's the problem with our job, right? Too many NDAs. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to stand up and say, hey, guess who I hacked last night? Those guys, and they sucked, right? We're not allowed to do that. All I can tell you is don't ever pay with a credit card. No, never mind. But, <laughs> so you go, I go out to this company. We'll say that, right? Does that work? Company? And I, I'm not allowed to touch the computers I have to assess. So they give me this doof. Right? You guys know what a doof is, right? A person that you just want to hit in the back of the head over and over and over again. So we would be more secure if you could though, right? Don't click that link. They click it. Whack! <laughs> they would stop clicking, right? Or we would work out our frustrations. But they give me this doof. And he sits in front of this computer and he says, okay, what would you like me to do? I'm like, well, show me how you do your job. And so he starts showing me how he does his job. Click, 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 click. Facebook, Facebook, MySpace. Yes, people still use that. But I don't know why. I say, hey, do me a favor. Click that menu option. And he clicks the menu option. And it does a drop down. I say, click that. And yes, I'm being very vague on purpose, right? Click that menu option. And he clicked the menu option. I said, type this command. And he types the command. sudo minus L. Nice, right? For the people who don't know, switch user and do, list the commands I'm allowed to run as another user. And it listed all commands as root, no password. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> right? This is, let's do a little dance, right? And I'm like, okay, type the command you should never type. Don't do this. sudo space su space dash. <laughs> Right? Switch user and do, switch user, load the profile, I'm now root. The guy sees a little hash mark, which is such a beautiful character, isn't it? It really is. Like, oh, Valentine's Day cards should just have hash marks all over them. But the guy goes, that's a root shell. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> We're like, duh. How did you do that? You did it, right? Like this guy doesn't even understand what he did. Another guy, developer, we do uh, ride along pen tests, right? Inspired by the TV show Cops. We <laughs> it's awful, right? We chase people down, they hide under, whatever. But um, we actually go into sites, we sit down with the company, we, have, we do the pen test while their staff sits with us and we show them what we're doing. So I'm working with this developer, and the developer is sitting there, and I find tick or one equals one semicolon dash dash, right? The stereotypical SQL injection. If you're still vulnerable to that one, you do suck. Because we've known about that one since sometime in 1740. <laughs> I might be exaggerating slightly. But this guy, so I type, I type it in, the guy's sitting right there, right? Bloop, bloop, bloop. It's their entire user database, unencrypted passwords and credit card numbers displayed to the screen with the CVV, which was beautiful, right? Because you're allowed to keep that, aren't you? But the guy looks at the screen and I'm like, oh, dude, that one's bad. Right? I didn't know what else to say, right? Whoa, he's you know, not allowed to curse. Um, and the guy's like, what'd you do? And I'm like, well, I, you know, I type tick or one equals one. And what this guy focused on was... Why would the database developers, the people who built Oracle and Microsoft SQL and MySQL and all this stuff, why would they implement that function one equals one? I'm like, it's not a function. No, 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 Kevin, why would they build that? Why? No, one equals one, right? Like, I mean, I, uh, I don't know what to say, right? And of course, you can't make a bet, right? It's a tautology. That just confused. that had more than one syllable. This dude didn't know what to do with it. But here's a developer, a smart guy, a guy who attended his monthly OWASP meeting. I think he slept through it, but he attended it. And he didn't understand the basic idea of what SQL injection is, right? 
If we don't understand why we do the things we do, how can we possibly protect against the bad guys? The people who really want to get in. Not the professionally evil people, the evil people. Right? We have to understand it. And this, this makes it even harder because now where do we test? How do we test? What are we allowed to test? Are you allowed to test your cloud systems? Are you allowed to test that third-party system that you've implemented? Are you allowed to test everything? Some people in the world want us to be allowed to test whatever we want, right? Anytime we want. And, you know, there's some good examples of that. And some people who are doing good things. Can I just be clear? If you find a bug in some system and you create a logo for your bug, please do me a favor and set yourself on fire. <laughs> Just right there, right? I mean, what the hell? I barely had a logo for my company. You laugh. I'm serious. When we, the way we started the company four and a half years ago, we, uh, <coughs> a friend of mine reached out and he said, hey, do you want to sponsor uh, OWASP DC? And I'm like, yeah, sure. What do I got to do? And we you know, gave them some cash and they put our name on the website. And I get a phone call and the guy's like, dude, where is your logo so we can put it on the website? I'm like, ooh, a logo. <laughs> Damn, we probably do need one of those. So I built one real quick, got business cards printed, everything else, send it out to the guy, he put it on the website. I get to B-Sides, uh, not B-Sides, I, B -sides. I get to OWAS DC, a good friend of mine, Tom Eston and I are gonna be speaking together, and I, I'm very proud, right? Ooh, here's my new business card. And I hand it to him and he looks at it, he goes, why does it have the key bank logo on it? And I'm like, the key bank logo, what is that? And sure enough, he pulled out his credit card and I had the key bank logo on my business card. <laughs> Oops. But, right, we have bugs coming out. And who came up with Poodle? Poodle, really? The next bug will be called Chihuahua and Gerbil. But... <laughs> These aren't scary, but we've got these bugs and they're being found and they're being used and we need to figure out where they are, right? Heartbleed. I can't believe I'm even saying the names of these things, right? But there are major companies who have supposedly been compromised by Heartbleed, exposing data. Now, I don't know. I didn't work those cases, but that's what the internet says, so it must be true, right? We have to figure out what we're doing. And one of the things that many people have advocated is self-testing, right? Not you test your stuff, because that would make too much sense. And the argument is not everybody tests, which is true. I'm amazed at how many times I go into a company and say, hey, we want to test you, right? Or they come to us and say, we want you to test us. And they've never performed even a simple vulnerability scan. I mean, let's be blunt. Nessus is $1,600 a year? If you're in business and can't afford $1,600 a year to, do, to buy a scanner, get out of business, right? You know, there's ways to deal with that. Heck, we've got a service that does it. I'm not trying to sell you a service, but we, I mean, this is what we do. And people aren't testing. And so some of the researchers out there have said, what we should do is test for them. We'll just scan the entire internet for Heartbleed. We'll scan the entire internet for shell shock and blah, 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 gerbil, hamster, whatever, right? This is what we'll do, and, and I have a problem with this. I do understand the idea that it's for the greater good, right? We're going to help out. We're going to let the world know who is vulnerable to these flaws. But there's quite a few problems, quite a few problems. Shell shocked is the one example. This is Robert Graham. And I want to be very clear, Robert Graham is somebody I respect greatly. The guy is really, really smart, right? And he does good things. And I believe in my heart that he is doing what he believes is best for the world. And he is scanning the entire internet. And he posted pictures like this on the internet. Hey, here's me scanning. Here's me finding this vulnerable system. Here's this. A couple problems there. One. He didn't have permission to scan, right? <clears throat> and I know the argument, right? What's on the internet, it's open. He also released the IP addresses of the systems he found that were vulnerable. 
right? Now, later he went through and he blurred those and, and did all that kind of stuff, but he had already released it. And we all know on the internet, if it's out there, it's out there, right? Um, talk to those people with the revenge porn, right? And I'm not trying to insult the people with revenge porn. I think it's a horrible thing, and I'm thrilled that guy got jail time. But once it's out there, it's out there. And Robert's going out there, and he's posting stuff out, right? Like, this is me right now. Serious, did you people think I wouldn't? Right? Because he was scanning the entire Internet space, the public space, going out there and finding vulnerabilities for shell shock. And, you know, I, I actually had a conversation with him on Twitter, which is the best place to have a conversation, because 140 characters is enough to make any argument. Right? And it was like, you know, you're running arbitrary commands. And his answer was, it's not arbitrary commands, it's ping. Like, no, that's an arbitrary command. How do I differentiate between your ping and the ping of that really bad guy who then wants to run something else? As a company, I have to respond to both the same way, right? I have to respond to the incident. We have a lot of examples of this. We had one developer, uh, one researcher, I'm sorry, attack Apple, right? Turkish security researcher. By the way, I want to know, did he have a white coat? But Turkish security researcher claims responsibility. He pulled 100,000 records out of the Apple developer network. Now, how many people here, if I recall correctly, it was a SQL injection flaw. How many people here have done SQL injection before? How many people here have done SQL queries before? Right? How many people here are aware of the fact that if you run a SQL query, there's a thing called a limit <laughs> or a count? where you don't actually have to pull all the records, you could put a count of the records, or you could pull one record to prove that this works. But this Turkish security researcher, I guess, missed that part of the documentation on SQL, because he said that it was required for him to pull 100,000 records to show that the flaw really existed, right? Which isn't true. Apple pulled the developer network offline for a few weeks, right? It was down. And this guy just said, no, no, it's okay. I'm not a hack attack, right? This is what he said, right? Like, look at this. Look at Apple, this is definitely not a hack attack. I'm not a hacker. I do security researcher. Now, I want to point out a couple things here. First off, how many people believe that O.J. Simpson could have gotten away with the entire trial much faster if he had just tweeted out, I'm not a murderer? Right? I mean, it works way better. No, Twitter didn't exist back then, but let's go with it for the sake of, you know, my example. Right? So, well, it must be true. But here's the other thing. How egotistical is it to believe that Apple is following you? Because they didn't use Apple's Twitter ID. He just wrote Apple. If he really wanted Apple to know it wasn't him, like it wasn't bad, he probably should have reached out to them. But no, but it's okay, though. You know, it's on YouTube, so that makes it good. And he did tell this Mike Butcher guy, right? And then he went after Google. And he crashed the Google Play Network, right? Because he was researching. Now, I don't care what you believe about the legitimacy of randomly attacking things. But I think everybody here can understand that this affects people. And I know a lot of people are like, well, yeah, but Google is a big company. Apple is a big company. Apple has $87 trillion in pennies in the office, right? We saw that about the Samsung settlement. Um, they've got cash. They've got money. They're big. They're behemoth. Google's the same way. They've got so much money, it's ridiculous. But do you know about the small startup development firms that weren't able to meet their deadlines because they couldn't get access to the system they needed to deploy? Do you know about the developers who are trying to get into the field that were just starting out, that couldn't because the developer networks were down, this impacted people. Google and Apple both had to react as if this was a real attack because guess what? It was a real attack. And that's the problem. You can have the best of intentions, but the other side doesn't know who the hell you are. All you are is somebody who pulled 100,000 records out of their network. Which, by the way, under breach notification laws, Apple now has to notify people, right? Because personal data got stolen. That's simple. There's a cost to that. Who's paying that cost? And with Apple, we all know, right? Because I've got a 
MacBook Pro up on the screen and right so yeah I am that's why I'm so angry right but this kind of stuff is going on constantly and we have this idea right what is ethics how many people here believe they're ethical right I'm always find it funny how many people don't raise their hand to that question I don't want to ask I want to ask that person right no but how many people here believe that their ethics is the same as everybody else's right I believe I'm an ethical person. I'm an evangelical Christian. I'm a Bible thumper, right? I'll admit that. And I believe that I live my life good. I believe I do the right thing. But I will tell you right now that what I consider ethical may not be considered legal, right? Because I have two daughters. I've explained to both of them that when they start dating, it's Florida law that I have to shoot the first person who comes to pick them up at the door. <laughs> Florida law, not my choice, right? But I'll tell you right now, you mess with my kids, <laughs> what I consider ethical, way looser, <laughs> right? Try me. <laughs> but seriously, what is ethical? Right? Because what is ethical may not be legal. For example, Robert Graham believes that what he is doing is ethical. I'm not going to disagree with him. In his ethics, it is. It's not legal. But he considers it ethical. Other people don't. I don't. Right? And we as a field don't seem to know what is okay. Right? What is allowed? What is ethical? What is moral? What is legal? Because we forget that whole thing about the U.S. isn't by itself. The Internet connects everywhere. And I'll tell you right now, the punishments in some of the countries for what we do is way more severe than what it is in the U.S., right? And we see stuff like this. Talking about ethics, right? How many people recognize some of the people up here, right? Weave, Snowden, the Jester. Because I'll tell you right now, I look at what Weave does, and nothing against weave, but I don't like it. I don't think it's appropriate to dox people. I don't think it's appropriate to be a racist, sexist jerk. Right? Yet there are other people that think weave was a genius because he showed the man by going after AT&T. Same thing with Snowden. There are a number of people who think Snowden is the greatest hero of our time. Right? There are other people, myself included, who think he's a traitor who should be shot because that is the penalty for treason in the United States, right? <clears throat> but at the same hand, we look at the jester. How many people here think the jester is awesome, right? <laughs> I do. Do I recognize the fact that what he's doing is exactly what I'm telling you people shouldn't be allowed to do? Yes, I'm a hypocrite. But I look at what he's doing, I'm like, dude, that's awesome. And that's the problem we have, right? Because what is what he did so much different than what we've did? I don't know. But I know one is one that I don't like, and the other one's one I do, right? That's how confusing this is. And we've got the idea the ends justifies the means, right? Look at Anonymous. Some of the things that come out of Anonymous, I look and go, oh, that was pretty decent. Other things that come out of Anonymous, I go, oh my God, right? And I'm well aware of the fact that Anonymous isn't five people, right? <laughs> There's no coordination, all, a whole, whole scale. People, anybody can stand up and say, I'm Anonymous. I do want to point out that if your Facebook profile that has your real name has the Anonymous logo as your profile picture, you've forgotten what Anonymous means. But <laughs> throw that out there, right? So how do we control this? I mean, I can rant about this, but how do we control it? The reality is it's going to be controlled. We don't have a choice. Somebody is going to stand up and say, this isn't right. This is. I'll be blunt. I'd rather not be that be Congress. Right? Can you imagine? I don't care what political party you're part of or not part of or anything else like that, right? I'm not even sure what political party I'm part of because the one I'm registered to vote under, I'm not so sure about everything they say, right? 
But when I look at the politicians in D.C., the politicians in Tallahassee, the politicians wherever the hell they are, I don't see a lot of people who understand what the hell we do. I mean, heck, we've all heard the stories about the senators and the, the representatives who have their assistant print out all of their email and then handwrite replies that the assistant then types back in. Right? I don't know if that's true, but I've heard it. I went and I spoke to senators. We were demonstrating how some of the mobile security flaws could happen, and we were showing it, Josh Wright and I. And we're sitting there with these senators and, and their assistants and their staff and their, all these people, and some of the questions we got were so ridiculously stupid, I want to move to that person's state so I can vote them out. It's horrible. But they're the people that are going to make the laws. If we don't help them. If we don't help build the guidelines. I hear a lot about ISC squared, right? And to be totally transparent, I am a CISSP. I maintain my certification with them through CPEs and paying money. And I will do that for as long as I possibly can because I will never take that horrible test again. Sorry, man. <laughs> right? Now, I will be blunt, right? Do you know how long it took me to take the, IS, uh, the CISSP? 45 minutes. Now, I'd like to say that's because I'm a genius. It's not. It's because I live in Florida. It was August, and the AC was broken. The company who paid for my test paid for my test no matter what. I didn't have to pass. <laughs> so I took the test. <laughs> I did read it. I did, like, I tried to answer. I didn't just Christmas tree it. I want to be very clear, right? Um, I pissed off my proctor. He was like, you have to go to the bathroom? I'm like, no, I need to go home. And the guy's like, no, Kevin, I know it's a hard test, but don't give up. What are you talking about? Let me go. It's hot in here. But I look at ISC squared. I look at GIAC. I look at... EC Council, and every single one of them has an ethical guidelines that we have to stand by. And I've had people argue, and I'm going to point you out just because you were up here, right? But I've had people argue that the fact that I read mailing lists that black hat hackers post to, like full disclosure, is a violation of the ISC squared code of ethics. I don't agree with that statement. God, I hope it's not. But that's how vague some of these standards are and how people read them, right? So what do we do? Whose guidelines do we follow? And let's be blunt. How much does that certification, whatever that certification is, really tell you about ethics? I took the certified ethical hacker exam. I took it as a joke. I passed. There wasn't a single ethics question on the exam. So how did they know I was ethical, right? I didn't even go to a proctor place. I took it online from my house. When I finished the exam, I'm sitting there, blue, 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 web interface, right? Blue, blue, web interface, yeah. But, right, I'm taking the test. My wife is sitting in the room with me. I finished the test. I'm about to submit it. My wife says to me, did you pass? And I said, I don't, I, what are you talking about? I don't know. I haven't finished the test. She's like, no, no, no. Did you pass? I'm like, what are you talking about? Because the re nothing against the EC Council, Certified Ethical Hacker. I took it because a friend took a class and got it, and he was giving me crap at work. Like, ha ha, I'm a Certified Ethical Hacker. So I'm like, screw you, and I went and took it, right? So my wife wasn't really happy about me spending the money on a test I wasn't ever going to list on a resume, right? <laughs> you know? So she was like, did you check your answers? I'm like, what do you mean check my answers? She's like, well, you're in the house. <laughs> Check your answers before you submit them. Make sure, I don't want to throw this money away. So I hit submit, right? Longest five seconds of my life. Can you imagine how bad my life would have been if I had failed that test without checking my answers? But I said to my wife, it's the ethical hacker exam. And she's like, yeah, yeah, but you don't care. I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> like, wait, this is a problem, right? What does this mean? And then we have bug bounties. This is a great idea. Hi, my company, I want to be clear, I'm not serious about this. Do not take this as authorization. But 
We have companies who stand up and say, you know what? Hack us. Then tell us. It'll be okay. Right? And we open it up to the world. And you know what? I do think that bug bounties are an interesting idea. I think in some cases, bug bounties work. Right? But I think that if you open up a bug bounty and they're finding cross-site scripting in your search field or SQL injection in your login field, you are a failure. A bug bounty in my mind, and I want to be clear, they compete with me, right? Heck, my report for a company was just used in a blog post by Bug Crowd as an example of why they were better than a pen test firm. I won't argue that now, <laughs> but I think they're good if you have a solid security framework to build on. If you're already doing security well, look at a bug bounty. But I'll tell you right now, if when my bank announces a bug bounty, I will get a new bank. Because you have these people, well, there's tons of problems, right? Are you solid? Do you know what you're doing? How do you track it? How do you scope it? How do you guarantee that the person who finds that flaw in your system is actually going to tell you about it? Because if I find a flaw, as I have, I found flaws in major financial systems that allow me to add millions of dollars to my bank account, right? I'll tell you right now, if the bug bounty is going to pay me a hundred bucks in a t-shirt, or I can transfer millions of dollars into my bank account, <laughs> right? How do you guarantee this kind of stuff? We have to think about this. How do we distinguish tester from attacker? Personally, another one that comes up all the time, licensing. How many people here have a license to hack? And I don't mean that sticker you printed out. I mean a real one, right? I don't even, I, I called the state when I started the company. What licensing do we need? What do you do? We're penetration testers. What does that mean? We click pens. No, we hack things. We don't have a license for that. What do you mean? They have a license to, I mean, when I joined McDonald's as a 14-year-old kid and I was looking at becoming a swing manager, I had to go take a test to make sure I knew how to wash my hands correctly, right? Yet I deal with multi-billion dollar companies and get very, very high access into their system and I don't even pee in a cup before I do it, right? We don't have any licensing. And there, there have been attempts before, right? If you want to do forensics, you have to be a private investigator, right? That doesn't work. I looked at it. In Florida, to be a private investigator, you have to have a year's experience working 40 hours a week for a private eye, right? I'm an established business. If I wanted to become a PI in Florida to meet those laws, I don't have, my company would close for me to do that, right? That doesn't work. So I have an idea, and I, I'm going to throw it out here. I've thrown it out a few times, and people seem to like it, but we also need to actually do something about it. But I think that we need to self-regulate. I don't think we need licensing necessarily or anything else like that, but I think we need to self-regulate. And the model I've m built this off of, the, the reason I believe this is the movie industry. Years ago, the movie industry did whatever they wanted. They produced movies, and they put it out, and there was whatever they wanted in it. And then the, some people started complaining. And the government started talking about regulating what could be in movies. That's a good idea. Hope you heard the sarcasm there. <laughs> right? We'll regulate what's in movies. So what did the movie industry do? They created a rating scale. And they applied it to themselves. Hey, look, government, we don't need you to regulate us. We did it. We got it. We got this covered. Right? And the government went, oh, okay, cool. And then in the 80s, a horrible brain-twisting, life-scarring movie came out. I'm a different person because I saw Gremlins. <laughs> For the old people in the room, we all get that, right? But <laughs> Gremlins came out, and it was PG. But they blew up a fake puppet in a microwave. Spoiler warning. <laughs> right? And so people are like, ah, this is horrible. You know, but. So what did the movie industry do? Because the government, again, started talking about regulation. What did the movie industry do? They changed the rating system. We now have PG-13, because I guess when you're a teenager, you can see puppets blow up in microwaves, right? So I think we should build something like that. 
I call it the InfoSec bar. I'm well aware that the legal bar is a government entity, right? It's tied to the government. I think we should build something that is tied to us. And we come up with a set of ethical standards. We come up with something like the PTES. Matter of fact, I think the PTES is a good basis, right? That says this is what's okay. And this is what's not. And here's why. And we figure that out. And let's be blunt. I'm not smart enough to say what's okay and what's not. I'm smart enough to know what I think is okay and what is not. But we need a group of people who can come together and say, this is what we're going to do. And we need to then start enforcing it. And you say, how do you enforce that? Well, we break kneecaps. No. All we start saying is, we market the idea that a bar member is following a set of standards. I've actually talked to people like John Strand, and, and we've discussed the idea that if you're a member of the bar, you take your example reports, what you do, and you put it out for public display. This is the work I do. So we stop having pen testers run Nessus and change the logo, right? We start building standards and we hold each other to it. And by the way, let's be blunt. Who better to enforce a technology-based system than a group of people who can break the technology when you abuse it? You know, like the logos that people put on websites to say, hey, we're a member of this. We could take it off their website if they stopped following it. <laughs> we'll go there, right? But we need to figure something out. We need to do something because security is important. I look at my daughters. Like I said, I'm going to talk about them, right? And this is the mushy part, because my daughters are growing up in a world where they have had technology since they were born. It's inherent in everything they do. And my daughter, oldest, when she was eight, nine, nine years old, she was diagnosed with a seizure disorder. She was diagnosed with OCD. And she was at Wolfson's Children's Hospital being treated, and thank God, She'll outgrow it before she's 16 with no long-term effects, the seizure disorder. She'll always have OCD, but so do I, so she'll deal, right? About two months later, her social security number and all of her personal data were stolen from Wolfson's Children's Hospital. She was given a year of free credit monitoring. The problem is, at nine, you're not allowed to sign up for a year of free credit monitoring, so that was useless. And this is the reality she's going to grow up in, is that her identity can be somebody else's. And it's our job to stop that. And if we can't even figure out what we should be allowed to do, how can we hold ourselves up to the next generation and say, be good, do good? And that's all I want us to do, right? Is to stand up, and be good. We have an opinion of ourselves that we're heroes. Many of us think we wear capes. We're on pedestals. We're celebrities. We're not. When we stand up on stage, when we stand up in our companies, when we stand up in our lives, I want to be able to say to people, I'm a hacker, and not be embarrassed by it, and have people understand the pride that I have to be in a group like this. And I think if we keep going the route we're going, we're going to lose that pride. We may not realize it, but we are. We need to be good. And that's all I can say. Go forth, be good. Thank you.